think. I'll take POIs in chat. Starting in three, two, one. This policy is a horrible idea. Two pieces of framing and setup. First, what do these sorts of countries usually look like? They're often post-colonial societies considered the Hausa and Zarma ethnic groups within Niger or post-conflict countries like Myanmar with Bamar and Rakhine and various different Shan ethnic enclaves, Sri Lanka with the Tamils and Sinhalese ethnic groups, and in many cases in extreme instances post-genocidal, consider Hutu and Tutsi groups in Rwanda. These ethnic differences and cleavages are often compounded by underlying religious differences. Consider the distinctions between Druze and Muslims within Lebanon or Muslims and Hindus within India. Importantly, that means much of opening government's material on political integration is unlikely. Decades, even centuries of hatred between various groups propagated by powerful elites and enforced upon these countries by colonial regimes often means the response to this policy is outright backlash and political inflammation as opposed to the healing opening government claims. Secondly, opening government champions the largest and most controversial policy that many countries will historically have ever implemented, which means this policy demands an enormous of political capital. We are happy to use all of that political capital to implement targeted and localized policy reforms to limit the specific problems opening government is concerned about. For example, relaxing zoning laws and limiting the permit systems that often bar access to affordable housing in mixed income areas is a far better way to facilitate housing integration, or the outright abolition of political gerrymandering or redlining or the direct allocation of federal and fiscal resources to indigenous communities. If opening government wants to fix a problem, they must demonstrate this policy is uniquely capable of doing so in as much as we have counter fiat per OO. Three contributions then from opening opposition. First on politics and violence. Second on economics. Finally on the principle. First argument on politics. Opening government preempts all of our material on violence through social contact theory. That doesn't work for at least three reasons. First, people's subconscious and cognitive confirmation biases render contact theory null because many people's beliefs of racial prejudice are deeply ingrained such that every interaction they have with members of different ethnic groups often self-selects into the details which reconfirm their underlying prejudice, hence intensifying, not limiting bias. Secondly, the fact that people have such legitimate grievances with other ethnic groups often means that you never get contact in the first place on their side of the house. So you, for example, have Sinhalese individuals within Sri Lanka who lock themselves in gated communities, even when the neighborhood writ large is ethnically representative. You have barbed wire fences installed across your local community or your streetway such that other members of the different group never contacts you. You send your children to private school as opposed to interact with members of opposing groups that you're often deeply afraid of. But thirdly, opening government's policy intensifies ethnic tensions. The direct outrage and backlash caused by this policy is intense. People legitimately fear like their neighborhoods, their communities, their religious institutions are being taken away. And importantly, the fact opening government is staggering this policy in worsens that effect. It is on their side of the house that this policy is announced and people's immediate reaction is political outrage. Populists weaponize this as a powerful tool in campaigns, hence inflaming tensions well before opening government's policy even kicks in. That takes contact theory out of the debate. But why is this policy actively terrible for violence and political stability? First, majorities in many instances feel perceptually unsafe, which often means that you, in essence, bar minorities from having any real voice in politics, because now minority groups are often the only members within these ethnically representative communities. You strip people, for example, away from their historical land, to which they often feel a strong personal or religious or spiritual connection. The problem then is those minorities are trapped into broader electoral constituencies where they definitionally are the minority. At least under status quo, there are, there are electoral incentives to campaign to those specific areas that is stripped away on their side of the house. Furthermore, you you intensify ethnic violence on their side of the house because you feel as a member of either a privileged majority or a disenfranchised minority like the state is for forcing communities to coexist, which intensifies all of the underlying prejudice. But most importantly, opening government massively intensifies secessionist violence. Consider the Biafran province in Nigeria, or ethnic enclaves in Manipur, or Karen, Chin, Kashin, or Shan ethnicity states within Myanmar. All of those movements become far more violent on their side of the house, because there is a legitimate fear of cultural erasure. On their side of the house, you are terrified that you will be forced to move into an area where you do not have access to a mosque, where your local community is torn apart. 
even if that's not true in reality, the perception is intense. And that drives young men to, for example, pick up arms and engage in violence. And militaristic elites and the secessionist figure has weaponized that narrative powerfully. But additionally, government's policy probably is a very convenient political cover for states to outright abuse minorities under the guise of simply rezoning or moving people across different areas. Even if they attempted to do so on either side of the house, they have a powerful justification to do so on their side. Violence is the most important impact in the debate. You must be alive to access any meaningful level of benefit, and hence is logically prior to the rest of the debate. And economic stability is contingent on political stability and not active violence on the ground, hence deterring investment. Before I talk about economics, CG. Okay. Let's talk about economics. Their policy is disastrous for low-income minorities. Why is that? First, ethnically diverse neighborhoods often translate to massively mixed-income neighborhoods. The problem then is that local privileged ethnic groups gentrify neighborhoods by pushing rent and housing prices up, which means disadvantaged minorities are often left paying more for their rent and more on their mortgage. The problem is that even if your wages go up on their side of the house, those gains are outweighed by increased housing costs. Because under status quo, middle low-income workers who often live, for example, in ethnic enclaves or regionally segregated areas can still find jobs in wealthier neighborhoods and commute, which means they're able to pay lower rent prices in status quo where they live than on their side of the house. And that is terrible because it means you spend more of your disposable income on rent, which is relatively price inelastic, hence reducing the economic bargaining power of minorities. Additionally, access to public services and political bargaining is far worse on their side. The way you improve public services and amenities like education systems and hospitals, especially in poor countries, countries is by having unified blocks and coalitions of voters pushing in tandem for public service construction and state investment. The problem is twofold on their side. The first is that public service needs differ based on communities. Some schools need to cater to at-risk students. Others need to offer advanced IB courses. The problem is that wealthy individuals now have outsized power to demand that local services in their areas cater to their needs as opposed to those of the disadvantaged minorities put into those areas. But additionally, you worsen access to economic opportunity on their side of the house. You no longer, for example, have ethnic enclaves where you are able to share cultural and religious experiences with one another. You're often forced into areas in which you do not have agglomeration economies, whereby you access services with a rest of your ethnic group. And in that case, on their side of the house, you functionally disavow minorities to a life of poverty. And you lastly worsen economic growth on their side of the house by literally destroying real estate markets. This sounds banal, but it's not. On their side of the house, this regulation massively deters housing construction. It is the biggest barrier to building housing housing and issuing mortgages and rent because there is now an arbitrary quota imposed on who can and cannot access housing, which means that you immediately collapse the financial system. Oppose. I'd like to thank the speaker for that speech and invite the Deputy Prime Minister to continue the case for OG. Hi, uh, I will just in hopefully less than a minute organise my papers and get everything up while I'm doing Excellent. Be wise in the chat exclusively, please. I also assume I'm audible. You are. Lovely. One bit of framing that marginalizes opening government's benefits. All the problems of segregation and redlining they describe are solved on our side, both due to natural trends and due to meaningful alternatives we identify. Firstly, there are natural trends that result in segregation, reducing neighborhoods becoming more diverse and more mixed in some cases. The first reason is because wealthy neighborhoods increasingly need blue collar workers, often blue collar workers who live near them. These are often more likely to come from ethnically minority backgrounds, given the fact that they are more likely to be low income due to historic disprivilege. The second reason is because low property values are actually something wealthy individuals, which are often ethnic majorities, can exploit. Because if, they, if you have low property values, you're spending less money on rent, even as an upper middle class person, and therefore you move into a neighborhood that has substantial composition of minorities. That's why, for example, neighborhoods like Brixton in London are becoming substantially more mixed. In fact, I would argue that constitutes gentrification that's bad and they make worse. Thirdly, there are clear alternatives to end problems like redlining, like abolishing zoning laws or literally ending gerrymandering that we can use this political capital for instead. As a consequence, the cases that matter in this debate are cases where people choose to live in communities of similar ethnicities and they break those up. 
The first path to victory for opposition is this is literally a ridiculously unjust policy. Why is this the case? The first reason is this is stealing communities away from people. Living with members of your ethnicity is often something you are entitled to because you're living with people who understand you and share your culture and your community. Finding community is a critical part of people's identity. It's who they communicate to. It's who they express themselves to. And importantly, the history that they describe is not just one of redlining. It's also one where people from marginalized backgrounds were often stripped from their communities. Consider, for example, stolen generations of indigenous communities who were stripped from their families and forced to integrate or assimilate with broader society, thus losing access to their communities and culture. Proposition amplifies those harms. How do we weigh this principle over their claims on redlining? Simple weighing. People choose the communities in which they live on our side. So you can move to a mixed neighborhood insofar as it exists on our side, whereas on their side, individuals have no choice to stay within a community that is right for them. This outweighs any of their pragmatic claims because any of their pragmatic claims is violating people's rights to use them as a means to an end. This is wrong. It is not okay, for example, to harvest someone's organs by murdering them, even if that saves five other people, because people have self-ownership over their organs. The second claim, though, is about property rights, which is people have a right to their property insofar as they often work to accumulate that property. Maybe rich people stole that from their property in some cases, but a lot of middle class and low income individuals are genuinely morally entitled to the property that they accumulate over time. They have strong attachments to their neighborhoods and communities that you are stripping from them. This is fundamentally an abrogation of that right. Second, I want to talk about economic development and economic opportunity. This is more important than their claims on politics and social justice for three reasons. One, because poverty kills voter turnout. None of their claims on minorities getting access to political representation matters because if people don't have jobs, they do not have the time to stand in line to vote because they are stressed looking for a job, nor do they have faith in the political system. Second, because of scale, economic development that is inclusive affects everyone, both minorities and majorities who are vulnerable, which is simply three times the number of people. And finally, economic development is the path to social progress. There's a reason why first world countries are the ones that are most advanced on issues like women's liberation and have less ethnic conflict. Why then do they kill economic opportunity? Their claim is public services improve on their side because guys, rich people will now push for good public services. They have much worse access to public services on their side for a number of reasons. One, because they kill state budgets. Literally, they are funding mosques in every community. Where in the world is the developing country getting this money? Often by gutting public services. Second, because public service needs are different. So wealthy individuals or people from majority backgrounds might want schools with AP classes, while disadvantaged communities that often overrepresent minorities might want schools that cater to at-risk students. Critically, the minorities are A, a minority, and B, often poorer, meaning they are less represented in the political system and don't get the public services they deserve. Third, sometimes the most wealthy individuals, who in many countries have monopolies over the political system, literally don't use public services because they have private substitutes for those services, like sending their kids to private school. Except now you don't have a unified political coalition pushing for a public school in your neighborhood. But fourth, this kills state planning. Massive amounts of internal migration means you don't know how many people will be in one neighborhood where you need a public service to exist. Comparatively, at least parties can't literally ignore the interests of even one or two politicians in parliament. However, they kill economic development more broadly. Why is this true? First, they kill migration. This is critical. Internal migration is the primary pathway to development in most countries. Empirically, you move people from rural areas to urban areas that attracts manufacturing. Problem, people don't move out of rural areas anymore because a lot of people, especially from different ethnic backgrounds who tend to live in rural areas, look for communities that are similar to them where they can find support. Second, they inflate the cost of living in these communities because mixed neighborhoods are much higher cost of name, uh, are much higher cost of living than neighborhoods with primary minorities in them because high levels of wealth inequality massively inflate things like home values in particular neighborhoods. Before I explain this point, closing. Okay, opening. So let me get this straight. You claim our policy is happening organically, but you want to use your counter fiat in a piecemeal fashion to do it anyway. What do you actually support in this debate? We want people to be able to choose to move to mixed neighborhoods. We don't want to force mixed neighborhoods neighborhoods on them. 
Second, this substantially raises costs of living because if large amounts of wealthy people live in your community, they bid the price of everything up. This is critical because this outweighs any potential gains to wages when your wages are absorbed up in rent and you have no access to anything else. Finally, financial instability. Housing values depreciate. When loans get defaulted on, banks have no value. The system collapses. Finally, on political effects. Their primary claim is about contact theory. This is ludicrous. One, gradual contact still exists on our side, but contact alone is not a good thing. White people are still likely to limit their kids' contact with Black students who live near them because their inbuilt racism continues to exist on both sides. But insofar as interaction does exist, it's often bad interaction like ethnic violence. They say states foresee this problem and include people in discussions. But discussions don't solve the underlying problem because when racial animosity exists and majorities feel like living next to minorities who they perceive as criminals was forced on them that causes anger and resentment that leads to violence that targets the minorities they care about. Very powerful, of course. I'd like to thank the speaker for that speech and invite the member of uh, government to start the case of CG. Um, one second. I'll be taking verbal POIs. <laughs> Okay. Um, um, okay. Starting in three, two, one. Three extensions for member. Firstly, analytical on social contract theory. Secondly, on less sectarian politics. Finally, on mixed income communities being good. So firstly, briefly on social contract theory. I think I just briefly want to note two things. The first thing is that although I think opening government says that there will be interactions between these people now and those interactions will be good, they probably lack some analysis about why those encounters have to be good. So what I'm going to say is, the fundamental reason that these encounters are going to be good or at least net good is because when you encounter other people, you have the ability to challenge stereotypes about them. And I want to note how this engages with O's preemption, that you self-select what you think about people based on the subconscious notions you have about them. The first thing to note is this probably can't operate if reality is significantly different than stereotypes. So if you have a neighbor that is super, super hardworking of a different ethnic group, it's difficult to see what you would select to make that person appear lazy in your mind. But the second reason is that on a long long time scale, when you grow up associating in a community with multi-ethnic friends, going to a school with teachers who are different ethnicities than you, those stereotypes don't have time to develop. The second thing I want to note is why these interactions are inevitable, which is another burden I don't think OG fulfills. The reason these interactions are inevitable is because insofar as people occupy the same space, they will have incidental interactions. So even if you believe literally everything that opening opposition says, like they'll send their kids to private schools, they'll shop in different stores, there are still going to be interactions on the street in, in, um, in incidental fashion. You're still going to say hi to your neighbors. You're still going to be driving in traffic together. And I think the other thing to note here is that a lot of what opening opposition says is also probably just like off motion. So the idea that you could build like a second gated neighborhood in the middle of a neighborhood probably defies what the idea of a neighborhood is. I don't even know what governmental body would let you build like a wall in the middle of the street. So I think there is just going to be some degree of interaction. This interaction will be good. This is good because it depends stereotypes. It deals with discrimination over time. Moving into entirely new extensions then. Firstly, on sectarian politics. I think the first piece of framing to note here is that most political systems are likely to be first past the post. The reason for that is that firstly, when countries were set up, constitutional framers were uniting a disparate group of very different local people, and those people wanted local representation. So that meant we have political systems where instead of everybody in the country voting into a pool of candidates who represent the nation, you vote for a local representative who stands for your constituency and afford them all of your voting power. Secondly, ger gerrymandering benefits the people at the top. So there are first past the post systems all around the world because privileged groups can marginalize minorities with this technique. So in the status quo, what this means is that minorities end up clustered in particular regions. They end up clustered there for two reasons. Firstly, historical development. So like 
there is a Kurdish homeland in Kurdistan and the Kurdish culture and religious traditions just developed there. So they're all still there, obviously. And then secondly, mutual aid. So minorities tend to cluster together to support each other, support their businesses, support themselves culturally within individual cities and within countries. And what this ends up resulting in is in multi-ethnic countries, you have a bunch of different small parties re representing the interests of particular ethnic groups, which align perfectly with economic and geographic needs within a country. And then these parties compete with other parties in a elections on ethnic um on the basic of ethnic membership. We think on our side, this political dynamic changes at the point at which you disperse people of different ethnic groups across an entire country. So I want to note here, when there is a majority ethnicity in a country, we probably don't get our impacts here because that party will just win elections. But we think, A, like this is symmetric and there are cases where this applies, but B, it's going to be rare to have a country where one ethnicity can just win every election by appealing to only members of their own ethnic group because minorities are likely to flee states like this where they're hugely outnumbered in. So these countries wouldn't be multi-ethnic for very long. So we think in the vast majority of cases, we're talking about plural kind of states where there are significant but no majority populations of different ethnicities. So like Lebanon is a good example of this. You have the Maronites, you have the Sunni and Shia Muslims, you have the Druze. None of them can outright control the state. We think on our side, when these people are dispersed across a variety of constituencies, it's no longer a viable political strategy to just appeal to your ethnic group and get like a quarter of the seats because you're not going to be able to win even a single seat without help from somebody else's ethnic constituency. So that changes the way political parties have to appeal to their voters. What are they likely to do instead? They're likely to shift to an ideological appeal like we see in other developed democracies or monoethnic countries. So instead of appealing to people on the basis of identity, so their religion or their skin color, they will probably appeal on the basis of issues. So here is a good policy I think we should implement for housing. Here is a good curriculum that I think we should do. Here's what our immigration policy should be. And the reason this is likely to be their approach is the same reason that it's a really good thing, because ideology is fluid. It's not heritable. You don't have to believe the same things your parents do, even if that's often the case. And it's not immutable. People can change and shift their ideologies, respond to different candidates and different times. What that then means is political parties are appealing on an issues basis to people. Why is this a good thing? We think it's a good thing for the reason that probably you have more likelihood to treat people well when you are in power if you think you can win them to your coalition or you need them for your coalition next election. So you can't do outright national discriminatory things anymore. But B, issues-based politics are just better for people and that point in which you're all working together to enlarge like the economic pie or the prosperity of the country rather than dividing it up among different focus groups. Why do political parties have such an outsized effect on lowering the degree of discrimination and inter-ethnic hatred in a country? Firstly, because they have direct control over policy. So if parties don't want people to be divided based on ethnicities because they'll never win power again, then they're probably not going to emphasize policies that divide people, rather policies that unite people. And they'll do the same thing with their language. So when they run mass media campaigns that get huge reporting, they're not going to stress ethnic differences anymore. They're not going to inflame or stoke ethnic tensions. Instead, they will encourage people to reconcile with their neighbors and form new ideological allegiances with them. I think this also takes care, by the way, of a lot of the violence material from OO in the long term. Last extension then on mixed income being good. So I think the basic premise here is when you mix neighborhoods with different ethnicities, with different wealth levels, you get rid of a bunch of status quo problems. What is this problem? The problem is that bad institutions tend to develop in impoverished, concentrated enclaves. So these look like anti-government paramilitary groups like Hezbollah, gangs, terror groups. These groups prey on the anger against the state, the fear of other groups, and economic deprivation. But they're actually terrible for the communities they inhabit. They extract a massive amount of wealth from the people they're supposed to serve, and after a certain point, they become unreal removable. Secondly, they also incur massive state repression against these groups and generalized suspicion of the minorities that reside in these communities. On our side, at the point at which you disperse people across a wide range of communities, mixed income communities just won't tolerate the formation of these groups. They will call police in, they will report crimes when they see them. But secondly, at the point at which these groups are less concentrated, they're less able to get together the sort of military or political support you would need to keep the state out, and they probably just break down to a large and greater extent. For those reasons, proud to prop. Hopefully I'm audible. Give me a second. Uh, wait, I lost my note. Scroll up a bit. Okay.
I'll start my talk show. Okay, uh, PYC in the chat, okay, one from CEO, start my speech in three, two, one. I'm going to say what everyone's thinking. This golf is horrible, and the only strategy I'm going to do this debate is to take CEO out of this debate in a way versus OG, and I'm going to try to play. So first, let's take CEO out of the debate very clearly, because the extension is uh, people are going to move to rural areas, and rural areas are horrible. I have a few responses to this. The first thing I want to do is I want to flip this analysis, because their analysis neglects the fact that there are already people in rural areas right now that are struggling, and if anything, more people moving to these areas will only improve the living conditions of these people. There are four ways in which it, this happens. The first is that at the point at which you increase the amount of people who move there, at the very bottom line, there's probably more exposure to all the shitty conditions that they're mentioning, i.e. at the point at which more people move there, more people are aware, for instance, of how these people are unable to access basic necessities like healthcare, or how they have no, uh, no job opportunities. This discourse means that now pe people in the urban areas are probably at least able to bridge the empathy gap, but also bridge the experiential gap, because they're unaware of the fact that a lot of these people live in abject misery in a lot of these rural areas in the status quo. Now there's at least some degree of it, like, um, social capital for you to improve these areas. The second thing I want to know is that more people moving here is probably innately good in so far as it attracts more opportunities and businesses and investment. The simple reasoning the simple reasoning for this is that the point in which there's more people, there's just more purchasing power. So things like businesses probably move there further. So you can probably face, like you can probably tackle all of the problems they said about how there's no access to things like groceries or like things that are fun to do. Or secondarily, this just also just attracts job opportunities insofar as more factories can move here, presumably land in rural areas are significant significantly cheaper and so therefore at the point in which there's labor now whereas on the imperative there's no labor because a lot of rural areas tend to be very very lowly populated at the point in which there's labor on the on our comparative more like more factories move here um in existence for the natural incentives of land and so therefore people are able to access the bare minimum of jobs thirdly there's just more voting power i.e you're able to counteract the problem that in the vast majority of instances these places are probably very very lowly populated she already recognized this because they said that often urban places are more glamorous and also have higher job opportunities so there's things like brain drain or there's just things like mass immigration outside of these rural countries the implication of this is very simple this is not a lot of people to vote and to become like leaders or key authorities who are likely to stand up and speak up about the, pl the plights of these people. At the point at which we remove these um, these problems by getting people to move here, you probably have a low, higher voting block which can um, like deal with all of the problems they mentioned. The last reason I want to know is that often historically, often a lot of these rural areas just tend to be very minor minority based, i.e. for the simple reason that historical reasons like colonialism often means that geographical, ge geographical um, separation means that there's higher development in areas that are urban and tend to be more like majoritarian race. So for instance, things, things like apartheid, insofar as it's the case, we counteract this. I, insofar as majority people are probably also definitionally have to move to these areas by the motion because the, like these neighbors have to be proportional of both races. Insofar as it's the case, there's now at least some majoritarian people there. So there's more cultural social capital for you to actually to actually advocate for these people. So if anything, we, we improve the conditions of this area. But let's say you don't buy this flip. There's still pieces of mitigation as to why this is probably untrue. The first one is that you, there's probably significant amounts of backlash and also Often, per the motion, majoritarian people move there, and so therefore these are the people with the most social capital, so they're able to at least publicize the problems that they're facing. It's probably not very politically feasible for the government to like fuck over people and not give them job opportunities, so this is going to be done well. Secondarily, economic incentives. Like, governments probably are going to fund programs. OG's magic bullet is they're going to fund programs. I'm going to tell you why. The simple reason is that they probably don't want to de-industrialize their whole country. They want pe don't want people to move there and become farmers and become people who don't contribute as much to the economy. And so therefore, they're probably going to provide basic job opportunities anyways. So I'm not sure the extent of, like, lack of job opportunities and the extent of poor living condition is as bad as this trying to pay. CEO is completely out of the debate. Then let's make our comparative very clear then. What, is, what did Max uniquely bring you into the debate and why does it weigh over OG? It weighs over OG in two ways. The first way in which it weighs over OG is that it proves the social contact theory better. Notice does it, he does this in two ways um, as well. The first thing he does is that he proves that a lot of these contacts are inevitable because though the OGs 
case is prone to res response coming from OO. There are a lot of things like subconscious biases often mean that you se separate yourself into like enclaves instead, so you don't actually interact. And so therefore this severely mitigates the impact of social contact theory on, our, on their side. Max dispels this analysis by saying that a lot of interactions are often inevitable. So it looks like things, for instance, you having to go to groceries, so you inevitably run into them. Or for instance, definitionally, they're, they're your neighbor, so you're probably going to see them at some point and say hi, or you're going to see them go to work. And so, you're, so, so therefore, you're probably going to dispel a lot of like bad, bad racial stereotypes about these people being lazy, for instance. Insofar as a lot of these interactions are inevitable, we prove that at least there is some interaction, whereas OG doesn't prove this. The second thing we did, and this is very important, we proved that the interactions are going to be done well. Because if you notice, there's a gaping hole inside of OO, uh, oh, OG, because these interactions can just be bad. Like these can just be people shouting slurs at the minorities. We proved to you why organically, in a lot of instances, these probably are going to be good things. The preemption coming from OO is uh, there's a lot of things like subconscious biases, or there's a lot of things like racial tension. I'm going to deal with this because OOG didn't deal with this. And so therefore, we also squarely going to place over them. The first reason as to why subconscious biases probably isn't going to be as severe as they explained is that we already said like there's inevitable interactions but there are also two other reasons the first one is that often things like recency bias also comes into play i max told you that you often don't want to think that your lived experiences are incorrect and so therefore there's some degree of cognitive dissonance that's introduced into these things uh introduced into your mind and so therefore you're at least forced to confront that maybe you were wrong at least there's some degree of change in our where there's no margin of change i think we told you uh, yeah, before we move on adpr from seal if you're a refugee who's been continually maligned by the government and punished for existing and are encouraged to move to an island that's like outside of the central, which has been generally ignored, why is the government suddenly going to care about you or that area? This doesn't make any sense. Because majoritarian people are going to move there and now you have impetus for you to advocate with these people. But also note your side, rural areas like have worse living conditions because there's less people. So there's no incentive to cater to them. Your side ignores rural people, if anything. The second re response to subconscious biases is that Max also explains why this is dispelled, i.e. you often come into interactions with things like stereotype in the status quo, but now this is dispelled, for instance, at the point at which you see your neighbors are very hardworking, so therefore you're probably going to be very more, much more amenable to them. We already squarely win on the social contact theory front. Secondarily, on the politics front, why do we win this? There's two pieces of weight that we provide. The first one is that Max told you that this is often most comparative. To countries where there's no clear racial dominance. This proves that often there's a natural incentive for you to cooperate for the simple reason there's no secured seat. You often have to cater your agenda to become a lot more diverse. OO just asserts that your agenda becomes more diverse, but I'm not sure why. And we provide this analysis because we told you that often you have to adjust your agenda because you can no longer secure safe seats or secure local enclaves anymore. Not that this is more intense, but it also overcomes SEAL's counterprop because if SEAL's correct, then things like gerrymandering probably happens anyways, uh, can be resolved anyways. But secondarily, if it's true, things like gerrymandering can be re introduce, um, for instance, things like ID check, and so therefore racial minorities will be fucked anyways. All of these reasons I'm very proud to provide. I'd like to thank that speaker for that speech. Just give me 30 seconds, because as much as this sounds like a joke, a sheep has broken into my back garden, and I need to get one of my flatmates to go and deal with the sheep, because, I don't know, it just seems like a priority. I'll be this like, really helping the rural area analysis. Okay, I've awoken a flatmate. The sheep should be dull. Uh, up whip whenever you're. Okay. Just going to take one moment. Starting my speech in three, two, one. I like how the CEO whip, the CG whip tried to take us up the de debate and then failed to do so. A few things. First and foremost, if you've grown up in the countryside, it's probably easier to live there for a few reasons. First of all, you've probably inherited a business like a farm or a repair shop or something like that from your family. This means you have access to this wealth. Second of all, you probably just have a degree of adaption, like shopping in the countryside is hard, voting in the countryside is hard, transporting in the countryside is hard. These are things that take time to learn. They take effort. They're pretty substantively hard. Insofar as these people do this, it's just simply harder. Note that CG whips 
criticism is just completely out of the debate because it's not like the population is magically increasing. Just as people have to go into rural areas, minority people, majority people have to leave them. To the extent that this is true, not only do we see minority people who have no sort of experience or adaption or links to businesses moving into these areas where they don't really know how to live or adapt. But second of all, you see people with businesses in these areas leaving, further decreasing their access to economic potential. This means that not only is it not the case that like living in a rural area is inherently shit, it's uniquely shit if someone is forced to move there and it gets uniquely shit when people are forced to move out. Note that they you probably also see a decrease in political capital insofar as minorities tend to have less political capital. And even though like the CG Whips asserts that like minorities live in the countryside because of apartheid. A, like whites are the like population minority in South Africa, so that doesn't even really correlate. But second of all, we provide to you substantive analysis for why ethnic minorities are more likely to live within cities. Note then that this is just mathematically true that if 50% of a city is uh, ethnic minority and 99% of the countryside is ethnic majority. People from the city have to move quite far to the countryside. Therefore, we definitely achieve this impact, like unequivocally. But beyond that, okay, moving into some impact theme. So first and foremost, this means that if you are someone with no access to gener generational wealth, unlike people in the countryside, no access to businesses, no access to experience on how to live into the countryside, no access to connections out in the countryside, you're now moved, taken away, up rooted, forced away from a lot of social connections you find valuable, forced away from economic opportunity, meaning that if you're already starting with less generational wealth than the majority, you now have even further, even lower access, meaning you get a far slower increase to your wealth. Things like this mean that substantively you how, like you completely worsen and intensify the economic oppression which minorities have received throughout their lives. To this extent, this is a horrific impact on the people who were forced away from their communities into places where they can find no economic or cultural sustenance. Note that even though Ojeev wants to say, oh, we'll magically make it so there's a billion jobs in the countryside, there are just practical structural reasons why even if you build one or two houses or one or two roads in the countryside, you're probably not going to have big factories there. Insofar as organizing a factory around 50 tiny fucking towns is basically logistically impossible, or putting one outside the city and having a bunch of people com commute in is incredibly easy. To this extent, there are structural reasons why the countryside will always have a low degree of employment, and to this extent, these people necessarily don't access wealth. Second of all, minorities see exceptionally bad impacts insofar as they're now torn away for their community support. This means that if before you had people around you who were protecting you, you had a community who had survived the same experiences of you, you are now ripped away from them, you now no longer have their support. With this in mind, I'm going to first on rebut CG and then way above them, then OG, then OO. Okay, so first and foremost, CG. The impact is primarily on places where uh, like you elect MPs or congressmen or stuff like that locally, and there's not a proportionate system. Note that, yeah, there's no delta on proportion systems because the population's changing. But note that uniquely the delta is actually probably bad on proportionate on systems where elections are local. Why is this likely to be the case? The reason this is likely to be the case is simply because of this. If I am a minority within a community and I represent 50% of the population there, I can elect an MP who represents my specific issues. These issues are probably specific because I face different kinds of religious, historical, and other types of malignment. So take, for instance, like indigenous MPs within like um yeah, Australia or places like this. I think even though they tell us that like um, politics getting more ideological is a net good, I don't understand why minorities aren't fundamentally entitled to people who specifically represent their interests. Note that this uniquely doesn't happen because the majority culture is now the majority across all constituencies and therefore have a greater degree of voting power. Note then that we have actually see a democratic decrease for minorities, the most vulnerable actors in this instance, meaning that their impacts are essentially flipped. Note then that, yeah, like, even if minority, like, even if this isn't perfect, this is probably a net decrease in power for minorities, and a net decrease in the ability of minorities to represent specific political issues. This means things get worse, not better. Second of all, why they don't really prove contact theory. Note that like OG specifically makes that we're building churches, we're building new institutions. I think what this means is that even if there's not like a community wall, I mean, people still just congregate around their churches, around their communities to the extent they can. To this extent, even if we get a marginal increase to contact theory, I think this is limited. Even if more more than just people having preconceived biases, it's more a lack of access to jobs, lack of access to system, like to generational wealth, things like these, which we've demonstrated get uniquely worse on our side of the house. Equally so, we demonstrate why things get worse for minorities. Okay, moving on to OG. Again, a lot of the democratic impacts OG tries to reach aren't really reached in any manner. To this extent, I don't think this really weighs into the debate for what I've said before. Again, gerrymandering, sure, happens, not actually that electorally huge. Um. Okay, so other things like this, 
yeah, I don't think they fully achieve insofar as A, there's an intense group of people, a large group of people who now have to move away to rural areas with less access to jobs. I mean, generational wealth, probably the most proximate impact on these people beyond things like contact theory or the likes, does decrease. Housing probably doesn't see a significant change insofar as there isn't a significant change to population. Therefore, they don't really achieve anything like this. And therefore, I think insofar as generational wealth gets worse for minorities, they simply have less access to culture and less access to, yeah, to wealth. Think we weigh above OG. Okay, finally, weighing above OO. So the first thing I'd like to note is that a lot of OO's burdens are too high claimed. For instance, they talk about like um, justice reigniting in post-conflict states. Note that A, there's likely to be safeguarding for this, but B, if this is a country that's very racist, there's probably a pretense for violence anyway, therefore there's a large degree that, to which this is symmetric. Note that we bring a uniquely non-symmetric impact insofar as we prove that people are ripped away from their support networks, which aren't symmetric compared to violence, which probably is, because again, like the random genocide happened, whether or not this happens, and pretenses for violence still exist, while safeguarding does. However, this safeguarding doesn't account for people being ripped away from charities, being ripped away from support networks, and being ripped away from mutual aid. To this extent, in regards to the most vulnerable actors, we weigh above OO insofar as we prove a more unique impact. In their broader economic impacts, I think these are usually non-comparative of OG and how it's been specifically met. Note then that like, yeah, it's probably the case that we bring a more concrete impact. They kind of depend on these people being moved into specifically rich areas and these people specifically voting badly, which is kind of less likely than simply the countryside being a structurally shit place to live in. And the simple mathematical fact that even if you're trying to move people nearby, if 50% of the population in California is Mexican, whilst 0% essentially is in Nevada, people will have to move from California to Nevada. For this reason, opposed. I'd like to thank that speaker.